Our next guest says a market pullback could happen at any moment given current valuations. Let's bring in Lori Calvacina, head of U.S. equity strategy at RBC. Lori, great to have you with us. So based on which metric do you think valuations are full? So we actually, we, we don't pick and choose. We have a combo model that bakes together 34 different metrics, and some of them are market cap weighted. Some of them um, are just equal weighted. We tend to use median multiples. It's sort of a bottom-up assessment evaluation. It brings in everything from price to book, price to sales, PEs, EV to EBITDA, you name it, we've got it in there. And um, it's telling you we're at, we're at pretty sky-high valuations if you just look at the S&P on its own relative to history. Um, so that does make us vulnerable to a pullback if we get the right catalyst to come along. But frankly, I've told my team that I, you know, while I, I expect a pullback at some point this year, I think the timing is very uncertain because it's very unclear what catalyst is going to knock that down or, or when it would actually happen. At the same time, I mean, you, you would use a pullback to go more into the reflation trade. So you believe that this is an area that will continue its gains? Yeah, and I think the market call right now is much easier from a bottom-up perspective as opposed to a top-down perspective. So when I kind of put the issue of frothy sentiment, frothy valuation aside, and I look at things like financials, I look at energy, I look at small cap, these are all areas that look deeply undervalued on a relative basis. They're also areas that tend to work when you're in that quote-unquote reflation part of the economy. So when inflation expectations are rising, bond yields are moving up. Um, so the question is really, is that trajectory going to continue? And I think we're kind of getting to an interesting point right now. We've all been talking about 2021. When does 2022 start to come into view? How much runway is there? So I've really tried to be clear with my team. We're not really concerned about repositioning our calls for you know, a 5 10% pullback that we might get in the market. We want to reload on these reflation trades uh, to get exposure for the longer term you know, sort of catalyst that we see there. Hey, Lori, it's Tim. Agree on reflation for sure. And I want to get at where you're just were on focus on 22 EPS, because to me, we, we've given mulligans for the last five quarters. Uh, when do yeah. we stop giving that mulligan when normalized earnings have to come back? Isn't that the time to sell or, or maybe just before that? So I think what's what's really weird right now about earnings expectations is that we're seeing these kind of mechanical upgrades to the numbers and dollar values, but the EPS growth rates aren't really getting lifted. So basically, you know, last year's numbers came in better than expected. People are bumping up this year's numbers and they're bumping up next year's numbers a little bit. It all offsets somehow. Um, you know, so it's basically like 9% earnings growth is, is kind of the consensus call for next year. The question, I think, to really get this market going again in a big way is whether or not you can boost that number. Can you get from 9%, 11% to 12%? And I think we're in kind of a weird period right now. I apologize for using the word weird, uh, but we're in this holding pattern right now where we've got these kind of inflationary pressures looming in the distance, which could eat into margins. But we've also got tremendous amounts of operating leverage coming out of the pandemic. We've got a GDP and revenue tailwind at our back, which is usually good for margins. So there are really conflicting cross currents right now. And I think investors, frankly, need more information um, to be able to get more bullish on earnings expectations. I don't think the market has enough information yet from an earnings perspective to make that call. We're going to get it soon, but we're not there quite yet. Laurie, it's Karen. Let me just ask you something about um, interest rates. We had a glimpse of what might happen when rates start to really move. Do you have some sort of cap in mind that uh, below which is fine, but then it starts to really affect multiples? Yeah, I, I will say that, you know, all the work that we have done points to a 10 year treasury yield at something north of 3 percent. Um, that would really, you know, kind of get you worried. And whether that's looking at the percent of stocks with a dividend yield in excess of the 10 year treasury, looking at, you know, sort of an earnings yield gap analysis, um, looking frankly at the historical moves, it tends to be about a 275 basis point mover higher in the 10 year treasury that spooks markets. Um, moves be below that, markets tend to be able to digest. Uh, we also just did an investor survey right before the long break, and we asked investors, frankly, we said, where do you think the 10 year treasury yield starts to become a problem? And in expectations were kind of all over the place, but two thirds of our respondents said above two and a half percent. Um, so that's telling you that, you know, there was all this focus on two percent, one and a half percent. This move is too far too fast. Even the people who are out there buying stocks, a lot of them don't think that we've got some more runway that you can move before we start to pinch market valuations. Yeah. And your model shows three percent, right? It's sort of the, the line in the sand, Lori. 
Yeah, we have yeah. one that shows 3.3%, one that shows 3.8. They're all sort of in that 3% mm -hmm. plus range. And, and I understand where people are coming at from the 2.5% number, right. because when you start to kind of get 3% into view, that's maybe when you want to take the risk off the table. Lori, great to see you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Lori Calvacina. Uh, Guy Dami, that's quite a runway if you go up to 2.5% mm. from where we are here. And then also the notion that inflationary pressures could be offset by operating leverage. We were just talking to Tom Lee about that yesterday, who thinks that there's still tremendous operating leverage to be exercised by companies. Clearly the bull case. I mean, input costs, clearly uh, people looking past. And I'm not suggesting Lori saying this at all, but... You know, that, that move to 2.5%, depending on how quickly it happens. And by the way, I do think we're going to 2% in the 10 year. I don't think the market's just going to be ho hum up until that point, and there's going to be this sort of uh, awakening at 2.5% where things fall off a cliff. So I understand why people would suggest 2.5%. My concern all along has been the speed with which we've gotten to 1.7. I think we're going to see equal speed up to 2% over the next few weeks. We'll see if I'm right. Clearly, though, the market doesn't seem to care. It cared for about three days. It doesn't care now. Yeah, certainly didn't care yesterday when we had yields up and we had record high closes, Dan. Yeah, well, they don't care because they're looking at real yields, right? And so if the Fed's telling us that inflation, they're let it, ready to let it run a little hot, and then they're also saying it's a bit transitory, and you talk about oper operating leverage on the other side of things, and you look at where the 10-year yield is at 1.66 or so, you still have real yields that are negative. And I think that's probably a big part of Tom Lee's call here, is that if we're in a situation where what are the alternatives right now, equities still look very attractive relative to to yields and relative to inflation expectations. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.